Thank you for uh, joining uh, today's lecture uh, at UCSD Trans-Korean Studies. Uh, my name is uh, Professor Kyung Park at the Department of Visual Arts at UCSD. And it is my great pleasure to have uh, Yang Sun Min to give her lecture about her project that she described a title as We Didn't Cross the Border, the border crossed us twice. And, uh, you know, as you know, that she has been very much interested in the social, political, cultural relationship between North and South Korea for years and decades. Um, so, this lecture will be about that. But the title also suggests uh, the idea that she will focus on three particular places that have moved between two separate lines that have divided Korea into two halves at different times. Now, she's not suggesting that these places, some of our cities have actually moved, uh, rather that uh, the line, the 38th parallel line originally uh, drawn at, uh, at one late evening in 1945, a week before the, the uh, surrender of Japanese to uh, Allied forces, that uh, the United States proposed the idea of divide Korea in half along the 38th parallel, which Stalin accepted it, and that was the line first. But then you know that Korean War started in 1950, and after three years of uh, war, the lines of the, uh, between North and South Korea have moved up and down through the peninsula, and then it ended up pretty much the same place as 38th parallel, but now is curvilinear based on the, uh, the result of a conflict frozen at the time when they signed armistice, uh, which technically makes Co uh, Korean War uh, officially uh, not have never ended. So those three sites are uh, the westernmost site is the city of Gaesung, which was the ancient capital of Goryeo dynasty. And in fact, uh, you might know Gaesung because of a Gaesung industrial complex that were allowed about a decade in the early 2000s, where South Korean companies opened up uh, uh, industries uh, in that city, uh, working with North Korean uh, workers. The second is, the, is kind of roughly in the middle of the the, the demilitarized zone that cuts across the peninsula is the town of Cherwon, which was uh, one of the most fierce uh, battleground of the Korean War, but also it was the ancient capital of very short-lived uh, uh, state called Daebong, uh, which existed uh, 901 to 918 AD. And finally, Kim Il-sung's Summer Villa uh, overlooking the Eastern coast. So she will focus on the uh, changes uh, that have occurred on these three sites between 1945 to 1953. And as an artist and curator, activist and educator, Yang Sun Min's career for the past 40 years have, has focused on the Asian American identity its colonial diasporic history. And along the way, she, her work has been supported by numerous grants and fundings, uh, including uh, uh, Korea Foundation. And uh, she received also anonymous was a woman award, Guggenheim Foundation grant, anyway, NEA, I'm sorry, National Endowment for the Arts Award in the New Genre. She had so many significant exhibitions, uh, including the decade show across Pacific, uh, contemporary Korean and Korean American art at the fourth and 10th Havana Biennale, seventh Guangzhou Biennale, third Guangzhou Chernow, Museum of Modern Art, of course, in New York City, Smith College Museum, LACMA, you know, it's in Los Angeles, 
as well as the Seur Museum of Art and the Commonwealth and Council Gallery located in Cape Town in Los Angeles. She has also curated as well, uh, which includes memories of overdevelopment, contemporary art in Philippine diaspora, three, which are uh, subtitled sites of Korean diaspora for the fourth Gwangju uh, biennial in South Korea, not in China, and trans pop Korean Vietnam remix. Min also has served on the board of director of Asian American Art Alliance, CAA, I forgot to ask her what the hell that is, and the Korean American Museum. She currently serves on the artist board of Institute of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles and on the steering committee of wonderful organization called Gyopo based in Los Angeles. She is now Professor Emerita at UC Irvine and with an MFA from UC Berkeley, followed by postdoc at the Whitney Museum of Independent Studies in New York. So without further, I welcome Yang Sun Min. Hi, thank you. Uh, thanks uh, to Kyung Park for the introduction and thanks to Korean Studies uh, at UCSD. So hello everyone. Um, Thanks for all being, thank you all for being here. Um, so at the outset, I want to apologize for reading from my prepared text. Um, I know it can be off-putting to some, but um, I also know that speaking extemporaneously uh, will last much longer than my allotted time slots. So here's the reading. Um, so the first slide, um, uh, is this uh, inspirational text that is actually the first line of her novel, uh, Pachinko. Uh, Min Jin Lee, the Korean American author of Pachinko wrote this popular novel about four generations of Koreans who live in Japan. Um, the author explains the phrase, history has failed us to mean that historians who rely on records and documents were not able to write about the poor or the powerless who did not leave records. Then she ends the sentence with no matter. I see these last two words to be crucial by providing her and us by extension, the liberties to supplement the official history with what can remember or imagine of the past. Uh, where did that go? Did it change? Okay. Whoops, not that way, that way. Um, I will briefly talk about three pro uh, projects before I launch into the last two borders piece that is the primary focus of this talk. All these works uh, take as its subject aspects of the division of the Korean Peninsula, uh, the becoming of North and South Korea and the Korean War. Ever since I got interested in the Cold War era in the mid 80s, I started to call myself a Cold War baby as I was born the year the Korean, Korean War ended. My parents and other parents that I know have directly experienced Japanese colonization of Korea and then the, do, and then the two borders. Uh, for this woke consciousness among other artworks, my art practice has been and will continue to be imbricated and intertwined with this history. Um, so one of the first works I'm gonna talk about is this room size sculpture uh, that's able to stand uh, with the yin yang S curve. Uh, Bridge of no return uh, dealt in contradictions inevitable uh, with the division of the Korean Peninsula into two nations. Bridge of No Return is the name of the bridge located on Panmunjom area of the DMZ that was used in the POW exchange between the, the two countries at the conclusion of the Korean War. Afterwards, it was closed for any crossing. 
This kind of tense opposition was created by the two sides that remain ever so close, but always ever so apart. Blue side represented North Korea for the color suggested to some, the color of ideals. And the pink for South Korea that was derived by the hot pink color of the Sampung department store located in the wealthy part of Seoul that collapsed in 1995. The, journalist, the journalistic images on the blue and red cards were countered by the propaganda full color images that face off in the middle, uh, what I call the third space. This work traveled to three sites and by the third exhibition uh, in a gallery in NYC, the word strips covered the entire metal cover on each side. The metal mesh skin holding magnetic phrases on each side suggests that underneath all the various divisions, all the various and division information uh, lie the persistent magnetic force of attraction and repulsion. This, the singing of common greeting, Bangap Sumida from North Korea and Rainy Day Women number 12 and 35 from Bob Dylan are uh, the two main sounds that fill the video. Uh, on two images seen on the left side uh, of, the, of this composite image depicts the video installation where large walls contained a grid of faces along with years under each face and the loop of the video projected over them. I'll talk a bit later about what all these men and years are about. Um, I'll play a short excerpt of the video alone. Let's see. Okay, that's the end, I think, of that video. Um, the, the clip that I just uh, showed. Um, or, and let's see. Uh, a I just want to say that a trio of academic women, me included, went to North Korea in 1998. On one of our excursions to Kungangsan, it was a stop at this tiny village where an election was taking place. We were told to cast our votes upstairs. The only vote to cast was for Kim Jong to, and one of his many titles. Um, the woman dancing below um, during that drizzly morning was what I videotaped. Okay. 
Okay, yes, I'm trying to find that. Okay. Um, in 2016, I attended a talk by Seoul based professor Jung Byung, uh, Byung Yoon, Jun for UCLA uh, Korean Studies uh, about his book, Alice Hyun and Her Days. He talked about this photo that portrayed the prominent socialist Park Han Young as a young man seated um, to the far left of, the, of this modified photo. Uh, but he wondered uh, who the woman seated in the middle row could be. And based on this curiosity, he devoted the book about her. She was 18 years old in this photo taken in Shanghai in 1920. He did as much research about her as he could, uh, but her records are few, uh, if not completely erased. Um, he discerned as much about her life from some well-known people who she moved among and filled in these, filled in more by these contexts. Um, from 1953 to 1955, North Korea conducted extensive purge of communists who defected from South Korea, mostly on allegations of being spies for American imperialists. The, the aforementioned Park Han Young was purged by Kim Il-sung in 1955. There are records of this trial that indicates that Alice was in North Korea and served as a witness in his trial. Then there are no more records of Alice and it's assumed that she had also been purged. I decided to try to sort out Alice's life using the basic compositional idea of chekori, uh, chekori which means books and, and things, uh, so I want to use that genre. I will show a bit of chakoris that I'm referring to. Uh, the conventional chakori panel is behind this playful example of bookcases uh, behind the lavish curtain. Um, these images were done during the late Chosun dynasty around 1700 to 1800. Uh, this handsome example has chekori, uh, check, has a bookcase, bookshelves behind a leopard skin curtain. All the traditional chekori are composed in panels. They all exude uh, the visual pleasure of all worldly goods along with occasional books. Uh, let's see. So I go back to that image, my work. Um, I utilize the curtain conceit, but my curtain happens to be the famous photograph that is loosely drawn, drawn to reveal the five bookshelves filled with some of the materials of Alice's life. The first shelf contains mostly images of female activism from the colonial period. This is my speculative projection of her life during the colonial period. The shelf underneath depicts her time in Hawaii from 1936 to 1941. Alice was born in Hawaii in 1903, but went with her family to Seoul when she was five years old. She then experienced numerous different cities before she returned to Hawaii. During her time in Oahu, Oahu, Hawaii, there were many letters, mostly uh, economic, mostly about economical survival, exchanged between Alice and her father, who was the renowned pastor and an activist who was based in Hawaii. The upper right corner shelf, um, oh, the right upper right corner shelf shows images in an open book of House of Representative, Representatives Committee of Un-American Activities that conducted investigation of her activities. Disturbed, Alice left Hawaii 
for Los Angeles with her family, where she contributed to left leftist publication called Dongir, or Independence, that is the focus of the middle shelf. The bottom left corner shelf uh, is designed uh, with motif of waves and depicts one of the few photos of Alice holding her son, uh, along with several books books, including John Byung Jun's uh, book on Alice. My version uh, of Chakori touches on a bit of her complex history. Alice's days were rich and in constant motion from Hawaii to Seoul to Shanghai to Japan, twice to South Province of Korea. Uh, to Hawaii, to New York, to Hawaii, to LA, to Seoul, to LA, to Czech Republic, to North Korea. It, it's, it's dizzying. Um, I consider her to be the first Korean American woman who was also a transnational radical individual who pursued her passion for socialist ideals. Ki Hoon Lee, uh, Lee a historian states that though the wheels of history has crushed and left her, it is the historian's task to find traces and restore them. I'm just gonna go on fast because I do have a lot of slides to show. So pardon me. Uh, shifting gears um, a bit, I will discuss my last and primary work. We didn't cross the border, the cro border crossed us twice. Uh, this map shows two borders, that is the focus, 38th parallel in relation to the demilitarized zone uh, curvilinear line. Uh, to the left is Kezong, which is one of the sites that I will talk about. Located somewhat in the middle is Churwan, uh, the other site. The Iron Triangle, the name for one of the fiercest battle, uh, battles during the Korean War, and also this also a strategic transportation route uh, in the central region of the Korean Peninsula is based here. Uh, the left side of the triangle base is Churwon uh, with Kumho, a little bit to the right, um, being the other base to the right of the triangle and Pyong Pyonggang being the apex of this tri triangle. I hope you guys can see that. Uh, and uh, along the east coast to the right, uh, just below Kozhong, um, is the third state uh, that was a retreat for Kim Il sung. Um, DMZ itself is four kilometers wide, uh, about 2.5 miles wide, and 250 kilometers, 160 miles long. Uh, the civilian control line was established in 1954 by the US Army to protect military facilities and operations uh, at the end of the Korean War. The line extends about 10 kilometers south of the military demarcation line that divides the two Koreas. Uh, in some areas, the military allows settlements in this area. Uh, I was one of three artists invited to this residency to spend the month of residency to mount the exhibition. The theme of the residency were, was borders. Uh, that gave me an opportunity to conduct research of two borders in LA before my departure. I arrived there with a vinyl print to cover the floor that filled half the gallery. Um, this view is from the East Coast all the way to the Western area around Kaesam. All of Korea experienced terrible tumult, particularly during the war, but I decided to focus on three sites that would epitomize the traumatic transition from being on one side of the division when the 38th parallel was drawn, then ending up on the other side after the Korean War and the resulting DMZ became established. I consider this project a historical essay installation. 
As you can see, there is considerable printed text on the floor that discusses some salient points about this eight year period. I appropriated my working title from the many struggles in the world uh, when faced with imperialism that states, we never crossed the border, the border crossed us. And in this specific case, twice. Um, this view is looking eastward uh, from his home. The black circle that I hope you can see there, um, uh, approximates uh, the location of each uh, of the city or of each site. Um, this historic image uh, suggests suggests how informal the 38th parallel was in practice. Um, in August 1945, when U.S. military drew the 38th parallel to divide the peninsula into two, it was such a surprising, devastating news to Koreans who had never lived in a separated country, even during the 35 years uh, as a colonial entity. Since no official markers or officials overseeing the division existed, people apparently crossed this border as, as they needed to. I don't know if you could see, see it uh, as it's difficult to capture in photos, but the number 38 that we saw in the village just before is replicated here and you know, on the floor and hanging above uh, is a straight line of glass stones. I hope you can see a little bit of the glass stones uh, hanging across the entire printed, printed gravel. Um, uh, the viewers entering this gallery has to be careful to walk in between the hanging stones. I wanted a means to suggest a certain abstract quality of the 38th parallel that still exerted a political impact. Back to the East Coast with the large Google red sign indicating the site. In 1935, in the middle of the colonial period, a Methodist reverend uh, had a German architect design this tiny castle-like structure pictured here on the far right. I hope you can see that, a um, little part of it. Um, this two-story house was situated on top of a promontory to provide a grand view of the East Sea. When North Korean President Kim Il-sung visited this building in 1948, he was charmed and claimed it. There's a picture bordered in blue that shows his son, Kim Jong-il, as a kid sitting on the steps of the castle with his sisters and one Soviet fellow to his right. The other photo uh, depicts some of the household items such as clothes and a cot and a huge shortwave radio. Put a bit in the front. Um, presently, this castle has become a controversial tourist site. Uh, that I happened upon when I was putting up a show at the DMZ Museum a short distance away. Um, next to the castle site is this mound made of catalogs produced by the gallery. Um, and situated above this cup is a two-sided flag. Um, the pink side has slogans uh, about the Korean War. Um, the cup uh, is a tourist item of mine that commemorates the 50th anniversary of the Korean War uh, with a statement, freedom is not free. I still ponder about what that could mean. Uh, the flip side of the flag uh, has an old saying uh, that my parents told me that the North Koreans have pretty looking girls. 
uh, made for Southern men. The refrain in Korean, nam nan puk nyo, that just means north, uh, north, north, or north woman and south man. Um, during the war, this propaganda poster uh, from a group of plentiful selections from South was meant to berate North Koreans and Chinese for lacking air power. They had some air power, but it was uh, much smaller. Um, the tiger of the poster is a beloved animal to Koreans, notorious for carpet bombing in Korea U.S. Dropped, dropped 650,000 tons of bombs, including 43,000 tons of napalm bombs that destroyed almost all the cities and towns in North Korea, force, forcing many to live in temporary caves and villages hidden in canyons, as well as in built underground spaces. According to historian Bruce Cummings, more napalm was dropped by the U.S. during the Korean War than during the Vietnam War. The other saying goes back to the early 20th century that when whales fight, the shrimp's back is broken. The whales in during the Korean War period refers to the U.S., Soviet Union, and China. Chirwan, uh, nicknamed Colorful Chirwan uh, during its heyday, was a vibrant city with over 100 inns and restaurants, many owned by Japanese with geishas during the Japanese rule. Uh, the existing train system then connected Chorwan to points south, such as Seoul, as well as points north, including Wonsan, uh, an important seaport city, uh, also known as the breadbasket for the country, it was surrounded by productive rice paddies. If we keep in mind that 75% of North Korea is mountains and South Korea has 70% of mountains, these rice paddies are a precious commodity, especially in Korea. A story has it that Kim Il-sung cried for three days after losing Turwan to South Korea. Uh, with liberation from Japanese rule, Korea fell north of the 38th parallel. Turwan uh, is represented by this building, which was built in 1946 as a North Korean workers headquarters during the period as Cherwon continued to be a bustling city. Uh, now it is the only building left standing in the area. I visited this building when I went up to Cherwon with a group led by Kim San Jung, a curator uh, in Seoul, who organized uh, the show, uh, an exhibition there. And she titled uh, the series of exhibitions there uh, uh, every year, the real DMZ exhibition. I was critical of this title when I first heard about it as I questioned why and how she could choose the word real about anything. But after researching the Korean War, <clears throat> I understood, <coughs> excuse me, I understood the intent of the meaning. The Iron Triangle that I mentioned earlier raged here as some of the most intense fighting took place here during the last two years of the war, 1951 to 53. Uh, the term Battle of the Outposts uh, en encompasses uh, the fierce fighting that, that took place during the final two years of the Korean War. Um, in the first year of the war, sweeping movement uh, up and down the peninsula characterized the fighting. 
combat raged from 38th parallel south to the Pusan perimeter then, uh, with, then with the landing at Incheon up to the Yalu River uh, that serves at the border between North and China. And finally, a retreat south again in the face of the massive Chinese intervention. After United Nations resumed the offensive in January 1951 from the US forces that still maintained the majority number in the fight, in the fights uh, against uh, the massive groups of Chinese troops fighting for North Korea. Um, with the start of armistice negotiations in July 1951, the ground war settled into a static period, static phase with action characterized by limited but fierce regimental or battalion attacks to seize or recover key tactical terrain, aggressive patrolling and increasingly heavy artillery uh, barrages by both sides. This sort of trench combat characterized the war until the signing of the armistice on the 27th of July, 1953. Um, these men on a commemorative stamp made in North Korea that I bought in Yanji, China, uh, were those faces uh, and the years uh, in my installation called Pangak Sumida that I showed uh, and talked about a bit earlier. Uh, these 63 men were imprisoned in South Korea for being spies for North Korea and uh, many for varying number of uh, 30 years, but one for 43 years. Other prisoners were freed at various points, uh, but these men refused to repute their allegation, their allegiance to North Korea. So these men were released in the 1990s by the edict of the then liberal South Korean president. Uh, and they petitioned to be repatriated to North Korea. They finally achieved their homecoming to North Korea in 2000. One of the men was Woon Hyung Lu, uh, who is outlined in red rectangle. Uh, his picture to the right was taken when he was being interviewed uh, before he got repatriated. And he spoke at some point um, of the interview about the fact that he was the chairman of youth committee who frequented the Korean Workers Party headquarters uh, in Chirwan. He reminisced about the varied function of the building with various offices. Uh, then the top third floor was left open as an auditorium uh, where citizens can come, take off their shoes and relax for various social programs uh, and dances and singing. Now this building is treated by many uh, in South Korea as a disgraceful part of the past. Uh, Pekma Plateau, um, also known as Whitehorse by the, U the, the soldiers, uh, can be seen from Churwan and has been one of the fiercest fighting uh, and has seen one of the fiercest fighting during World War during the Korean War. During 10 days of battle, the hill would change hands 24 times after repeated attacks and counterattacks for its position. American army officers let the South Korean Infantry Division take charge, led by Park Chung-hee, who later became the president of Korea from 1963 to 1979. What's important to my account here is that Park Chung-hee uh, was the South Korean president during 
the Vietnam War. As the at the request of the United States, Park deployed approximately 320,000 South Korean troops to fight alongside the United States and South Vietnamese during the Vietnam War, a commitment second only to that of the United States. One reason he wanted to send the troops uh, to Vietnam was to counter the US impress impression that South Korean troops were bad soldiers. Uh, also, Park believed in the Korean War domino theory that communism would spread if not stopped. Quid pro quo, in exchange for South Korea's contributions to the Vietnam War, they received, South Korea that is, received billions in aid that helped it to become an economic miracle in the 80s. U.S. President acceded to Park's sending the Bekma division to the Vietnam War and allowed South Korea to command the special unit that was detached from the command system of the ROK, Republic of Korea-US Combined Command Force Command. Chun Doo Won, the subsequent South Korean president after Park from 1980 to 1998. 1988, led the special unit. When Chun was maneuvering to become the president of Republic of Korea, he sent special troops that he led in the Vietnam War to the streets of Gwangju, known for biennials, located in southeastern part of Korea to violently suppress the demonstrations against uh, the martial law in the 1980s, in 1980. Uh, next to Bekma Plateau image is my photo of the Gwangju uprising massacre. Uh, that's from a series of six images of my embodiment of major historical Korean historical events. In this image, South Korean troops are rushing towards uh, the Gwangju citizens. Uh, the Asian American Literary Review published in 2015 asked writers and artists for contributions about the Vietnam War. I'm showing one of the three pieces I contributed to this publication using archival image of Korean troops in Vietnam. Uh, I'll read the text. Quote, in addition to the unexpected image of tanned and naked torsos of ROK soldiers, the war in Vietnam elicited another shift in our frame of mind, Koreans as aggressors. After the Korean War, Korean identity was that of a victim of the superpowers. This identity has been displaced by the ROK soldiers' reputation for cruelty in battles, as well as the numerous atrocities they committed uh, and had to face in Vietnam. This new aggressive identity was experienced soon after by their own people on home turf during the Gwangju massacre of 1980 uh, by the soldiers who had fought in Vietnam. No longer to this day can Korea be considered the victim. Kezong, uh, here, located below the 38th parallel, was in South Korea from 1945. With the outbreak of the Korean War, it was the first city to be taken by North Korean troops, and it remains with uh, North Korea at the end of the war, Korean War. Uh, the leaders of both North and South Korea revered Kezong, that was the capital of the Koryo dynasty uh, that reigned from 1918 to 1392, that unified the entire peninsula. Sigmund Rhee, Syngman Rhee, the South Korean president, never accepted that Kezong was 
was lost to North Koreans, among other issues. Therefore, he refused to sign the armistice agreement. Thus, the signatory of the armistice agreement consisted of uh, DPRK, or North Korea, China, and the United States, United Nations Command. I represented Kaesong uh, as a layered city. On the bottom was an old Japanese colonial map of the city that I Xeroxed on a small home machine that was at KW Lee's home in Sacramento, California. I was flabbergasted to learn, to find out that towards the end of our, at, of our meeting that the renowned Korean American journalist now in his late 80s was actually born in Kaesong and that was his map. On top of the map, uh, or, or layered on top of the map, uh, is the picture of the site of the royal palace that existed during the Koryo dynasty. A joint excavation done here with a group from the south together with a group from the north from 2007 to 2011. Among the many treasures that was excavated from the Koryo dynasty palace uh, was metal type that was invented in Korea some 200 years before Gutenberg. And Celadon ceramic pieces were found there that reached a, a high level of craft. Um, replica of Celadon, Celadon pottery was created, uh, I created them, uh, from cheap plates and bowls purchased from secondhand stores that were then hand paint, that were then broken uh, and then hand painted uh, in Celadon remotely, close to Celadon colors. Uh, then they were pieced together in parts with gold paint that attempts to copy kintsugi, the Japanese mode of repairing broken pottery. An ironic way to treat this fake dynastic treasure um, with a bit of Japanese touch. The other scattered pieces of choco pie referred to Kezong Industrial Complex that was established there in Kezong in 2003. This arrangement essentially capitalized on North Korea's cheap labor with the businesses from South Korea. The complex was temporarily closed in 2016 by North Korea with no sense about when it might reopen, if ever. South Korean businesses gave choco pies to North Korean soldiers as snacks or incentive for working extended hours. As choco pies became prized for North Koreans as a symbol of South Korean affluence and capitalism, they appeared on the black market in North Korea for inflated prices until Kim Jong-un uh, banned them um, in 2014. North Koreans made their own version, or they tried, um, of choco pies, which were deemed uh, to be inferior. These massive balloons are used by South Korean anti-communist activists who airlifted various propaganda to North uh, Korea in Paju City that is located very close to the DMZ. Uh, the content that they sent to in, in the, this picture included choco pies as these activists knew how popular choco pies is in North Korea. Um, a daring escape from North Korea to South Korea happened in November 2017 when a 25 year old North Korean soldier, Oh Chang Hong, drove his military jeep at fast speed to the DMZ Joint Security Area. Uh, that is also the popular tourist area where Trump and Kim Jong un met and crossed the division line. 
I'll show this video. Okay. And there would be, there's no sound in this first part of the video. Okay, you can see that truck again, or the Jeep. The key findings of the special investigation team are that the KPA violated the armistice agreement by one, firing weapons across the MDL, and two, by actually crossing the MDL temporarily. UNC personnel at the JSA notified KPA of these violations today through our normal communication channels in Panmunjom and requested a meeting to discuss our investigation and measures to prevent future such violations. Um, so, um, the North Korean soldier, you know, was dragged and, uh, and he was helicoptered, uh, to a nearby hospital where he does survive after considerable surgery, where they found five bullets and lots of parasites. Um, upon consciousness, he made his first request, which was to ask for choco pies. The Orion company, the first company to make this cookie, sent him some and told him that they would supply choco pie, choco pie for the rest of his life. Okay, I know that I have only two more slides to show. Um, I know I'm running out of time. I found this image of a monument for a former South Korean president who I respected on the internet. What really stood out for me were these intrusive, aggressive looking metal things placed on either side of the monument. What were they and what in the world? Um, later, I found out that they were used on South Korean side of the highway connecting Paju, uh, the city that I mentioned before, north of Seoul, uh, to Kezong, the last city that I talked about. Uh, in North Korea. In the far right image, soldiers are carrying the spike thing. So I guess here they make more, some more sense to ward off vehicles or possible tanks from the north. Uh, where did that go? Oh. Um, my soft cartoon like replica makes light of what is meant to be a functional road guard. Uh, on the other hand, I can see it as a sculpture that stands as a symbol for this absurdity of militarized borders that separates one group of Koreans from other Koreans. The insistence on security measures can be a pathetic endeavor that reveals an underlying and ongoing sense of vulnerability and instability. That's what you get when you have two countries next to each other that survives without peace. Okay, so that's it. So thanks very much. And I, I really wanted to, you know, talk to you guys and to, so I wonder if we could just extend it a little and to, I, I don't know, Kyung, is that okay? I run. You have to unmute. Yes. To, to, uh, to talk more, to, to lecture more. 
I, I just wanted to have a Q and A period. Oh now. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. We were okay. planning to have yes, a Q and A. Yes, you okay. are uh, allowed. I, I give you that authority. Yeah, and I, I really can't see uh, except uh, I see Jinny Yoon. Hi, <laughs> and and a few other people, but I don't see any uh, the whole. And Helen Oji, hi. <laughs> so I, so I would appreciate it if anybody had any comments or I uh, or questions. I, I know I went through my uh, talk really quickly because I knew I would barely make it. Oh, that's great. Oh, it's nice to see all of you. So, <laughs> so um, I, you know, there's I covered uh, what I thought was a lot of material, and I didn't do it with that much detail, but um, I hope uh, I could hear from you, some of you. Erica, hi. <laughs> Alice, hi. <laughs> um, and I would really welcome any, anything that anybody would want to say and uh, Alan, are you trying to uh, ask a question? Your mic is off. You're muted. Me? I cannot hear you. Helen Oji. Oh. <laughs> Helen, do you want to say something? Do you want to ask a question? <laughs> yeah. No. Oh, hi. Um, hi. <laughs> hi, Yun Su. So hi. good to see you and hear your presentation. Um, there were so many things I didn't know about, and it was really interesting to, um, you know, hear the content of your projects and uh, your research. I I don't know. I I didn't really have any questions. So, but I was fooling around with the. Well, I, I am <laughs> I, I'm curious. I'm, I'm curious whether or not you're going to be able to present this in a different venue. It's pretty interesting in terms of the, a lot of new information. I was particularly taken by, I did not realize that the volume of Korean forces in, in the conflict in Vietnam, uh, that's pretty significant uh, kind of new information for me. Um, and uh, I know it was exploited in a way during the time, I believe, but uh, I think they were people, uh, undoubtedly, they, they presented them as, as uh, Vietnamese or whatever, you know, to see the enthusiasm of the, of the troops. But um, I was just curious if you are planning any. Uh, any uh, yeah, thanks for that. I, um, there is a possibility, I think, uh, to redo and to improve that piece that I did in uh, at Davidson College in uh, North Carolina. Um, one of the things that uh, bothered me about that um, installation was that um, I didn't get the vinyl uh, print to, you know, be very flat on the floor. And also I was trying to figure out, I might do some other way of representing um, the 38th parallel, you know, which didn't show up that well, you know, um, to a lot of people, but, but, you know, uh, the viewers, you know, who were there were aware of it, but, um, but I was trying to, I'm still trying to figure out how to do that differently. And uh, um, I'm thinking of doing um, other different things to it. Um, but, you know, next year, I think that there will be a case, but it'll be here in California. But have you, has it, uh, initiated uh, further uh, kind of discussion with historians also it just seems to be kind of open to a really interesting a deeper dive into uh, the, yeah, that I, period yeah I by think historians not just artists but you, yeah. you kind of created these very uh, kind of seductive visual uh, uh, elements I haven't heard anything from the historians, <laughs> but <laughs> I really, uh, presented it, uh, aside from that show uh, in North Carolina, I presented in like three talks that I've given, but yeah, that's about it, yeah, so. No, no collaborations. Yeah. Yeah. It's so yeah. interesting, so many people don't know about this, you know, so it would be great if you could 
present it in multiple places. <laughs> I would love to. Of course. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you very Thanks. much. It was really it was great, great to see you. Also. Oh, so, Youngson, I, I, I have a question and a comment. I mean, uh, um, first of all, the, um, uh, the question was raised previously that something like 300,000 South Korean soldiers, not at one time, over accumulative numbers, right? Uh, but the, the issue is that. Um, you said that in uh, uh, in return of the South Korean soldiers in Vietnam, uh, which I somehow uh, begin to uh, think about that they were some ways mercenaries, um, whether that they got uh, grants from the United States uh, or loans or whether that it was, uh, let's say, payment for the service like you know, well, you know uh, every individual soldier's labor mm -hmm. was counted and it was like almost like a salary or you know a payment and where that money went did it go to the government first and well, then you know, went they, to the they, soldiers right the individual yeah. soldiers did get salaries uh certainly uh and but then the government uh Kim, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Park Chung-hee uh, actually got a, a lot of uh, loans and uh, money, a lot of it that ended up being like billions uh, from uh, about a billion uh, from uh, the, the US. So um, yeah, it did really feel as if it was a, a that they were treated like mercenaries, actually. But uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. And I mean, there were also a lot of uh, civilians who got a job in uh, uh, in the Vietnam War, and so you know uh, many of the uh, companies, uh, uh, Chebar, like three of the original companies, uh, got their start in Vietnam and then went on to make money. So it would uh, be interesting to. Uh, um, uh, to know, I mean, uh, obviously, the, the question is uh, whether that that particular subject of history is fully uh, examined and uh, critiqued, because I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, there would be a lot of gray zone area in that yeah. aspect. I mean, the Vietnam but, War I consider to be another Cold War uh, of uh, Cold War War. <laughs> uh, uh, the first one obviously was Korean War, but um, uh, Viet Le, I think he's in the, in the audience. Um, he and I had organized a show called uh, Trans Pop Korea Vietnam Remix, uh, where we investigated exactly, we were dealing with exactly the same thing that we're just talking about now, about the rela relationship between Korea and Vietnam. And um, so, we ended up selecting uh, the artists from both countries to be in that show about well, both countries and also those in the diaspora. So anyway, but, um, you know, it, it really became a really important relationship that I really uh, just was so uh, involved with afterwards, you know, because, you know, when you read about all the similarities between uh, the two countries. Um, it's just really amazing that, um, well, and it's, it's kind of another case where of the Cold War, Cold War wars that in both countries, the U.S. did not win, you know, and for a good reason. I mean, the first one in Korea was a stalemate and just an, uh, an armistice was signed and in Vietnam, they actually lost. So that makes yeah, yeah uh, the, I think it, you're right that the historical, recent historical relationship between South Korea and Vietnam would be interesting subject. The difference uh, obviously is that Korea still remains divided as opposed to Vietnam or Germany. So that Cold War, in fact, 
continues to live on in the Korean Peninsula, unfortunately. And uh, so that's a really big issue. But in terms of economic uh, history, is that that uh, Japan economically benefited a great deal from Korean War. Right. And, 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 and Korean, that, yeah, that, Koreans that, also may Korean have uh, from benefited quite a bit from the Vietnam War. So in some sense that the uh, wars have both destroyed uh, 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 many of the countries that we're talking about, but also became in some strange way, uh, you know, economic opportunity that throughout uh, at least some parts of Asia, you know, to uh, its developed state. So that's kind of interesting, but I have a question. I mean, the, the, the villa, the Kim Il-sung villa in the West Coast, I mean, East Coast, right? Mm -hmm. um, is that, does it still exist? And uh, is yep. it a, um, has it been kept renovated? Is it been, I, uh, yeah, I has mean, it that's turned what... into tourist site or is it being yeah. uh, locked yeah. up, destroyed, <laughs> erased? Yeah. I mean, it is, it is a tourist site. So, um, you know, people, some of the people, who are aware of it certainly went there and uh, and they get some other tour, tourist sites and uh, tourists. Um, but yeah, it, and, and the, the image uh, that you saw of the radio and everything is exactly the way it is now because I just took it several years ago. Yeah, I imagine. But you know, I mean, the anti-communists or people who are very critical uh, of North Korea, uh, would criticize and they did, they don't want it to be a tourist site. I mean, they just thought, why is that there still? But uh, yeah, but it still exists. Well, maybe uh, we should invite Donald Trump to spend the night there one yeah. of these days, right? Uh, any other questions uh, you might have, people? Please ask questions. I have a comment um, over here. Um, um, I just wanted to, hi, I just, hi, hi. Yangsen. I just wanted to speak to the text, the textual uh, aspects of this, and to thank you for this presentation, and and that it really kind of moves beyond um, just presenting works as a slideshow. That really, I think it's very important the voice through this as a kind of storytelling. So if this information was presented, say in book form or other ways, as a written text, there's something about hearing you tell the stories, tell stories, um, so that history becomes storytelling that moves through the images and through the work, through these layers of time and practices. I think that's really, really helpful um, and um, generative for, for those of us who are listening or learning. And I, I really appreciate, appreciate that form. And in a way, transcended the sense of our presenting work to a, a different form, uh, which I, I'm really grateful for. Thanks, Meredith. So great to see you. Yeah. And and that might be important, when, or might be something to consider as you present. You know that as in filmic sense, and that your voice was very much part of it. You know, in this um, in our. Uh, ability to apprehend and to process all these layers. So um, something to think of as a film or other live presentations, but I think it's really quite extraordinary. Thank you. I, I always feel that an hour is a short amount of time and I have so many works I wanna talk about, but, and so, you know, the, the works that I select, I just feel like I've just been going through it. And I just haven't, you know, even that small, print of uh, Alice Hyun, I, I was so taken by her, by her and her life. And uh, I just wish that there was more time to, to talk about all the details about her life. But um, yeah, it's, uh, but it, you just sort of touch upon it a little bit, but that's, that's it. Yeah. I'm, uh, I, yeah. I have a question for you. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, my name is Heech and uh, I'm really curious uh, about your research process. 
um, is kind of piggybacking on, on Meredith, you know, uh, talking about the narrative. So I'm wondering, is there like a story that you unravel? Like I'm really, especially if you're, uh, you spoke uh, in extensively about the piece, we did not cross the border. So yeah, I'm really curious how you began and what interested you. I mean, not just as a Korean American, but rather, you know, there seems to be something very uh, specific uh, about this piece. So I'd be really curious to learn more about that. Yeah, you know, um, I, I realized that when I decided on that topic to, I, I really didn't know as much as I should have, you know, about the 38th parallel and the Korean War. And when I set out to research that, I, I just realized, oh my God, it's really, you know, huge, <laughs> huge area. And I had given myself, you know, I knew about that show about uh, like a less than a year. And I, so I just thought, well, I'll just devote that time to, to research, uh, I, I initially read about the, uh, these different cities that had switched sides. And I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll just focus on Kezong for one and Churwan for the other. And, and, and then actually, and I remember that I had visited that uh, Kim Il-sung tourist site. So I thought, you know, it, it spans, um, Kind of you know the width wise the all uh, along the DMZ um, all of Korea and um, but you know but I could there was just endless amount of research so I only set a time period that I could you know to do as much research as I could and I had an assistant um, Caroline I don't know if she's out there um, help me with the research and uh, so. Yeah, and you know, and when I'm researching um, about Churwan, for instance, I just realized, oh, the man who I read, uh, I have several books that I was referring to, and one of the books was talking about um, Churwan and about that they had interviewed this man um, about that building. And I had taken that picture of the building when I, uh, went on uh, the trip to um, Churwan. And, um, and I never thought that much about that building when I actually saw it. But then when I read about the, the interview and about that man who uh, you know, was part of that commemorative stamp, and I thought I bought that stamp many years before and I didn't realize the significance of that and of that man, but he turned out to be the person who told me about that building. So it was just all these connections that I just coming out through the research that was revelatory to me. And uh, so, so those are, and I, I have to say that that um, uh, historical research um, about those sites, uh, they inform me, but I have to say that I, I'm using, I'm standing on my platform as uh, an immigrant, you know, who's lived in the U.S. since I was seven for over 40 years. And so I feel that <laughs> it's sort of an excuse, but, but maybe not an excuse, but I, but I want to deal with, with the information that I get and, and, and use it in such a way that, um, you know, in some ways I make a little bit light of it, you know, and, and I'm talking about that, uh, the fat so that 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 yellow thing that I made, um, and it was just you know, also that thought, seeing that image of that monument with those two things on the side, and I thought, I never you know I've never seen that anywhere else in the world, and then I realized it's only used in Korea right by the border. And I thought that is such an unusual thing. And, but it's, it's kind of, you know, it's very attractive in some ways in its, in its curious form. And um, so I, I, I allowed myself to just go with my, um, my 
a little bit of interest and uh, curiosity and uh, my kind of off sense of humor just to kind of play into this whole thing. And so it's not exactly, uh, I mean, you know, some of the basics are in all the history books, but then some of the interpretations and I'm just applying my own sense of interpretation to it. I have a question along those same lines of just like your own critical notes or, you know, the way that you kind of self-regulate knowledge and news uh, in terms of, you know, anybody that studies a little bit of Korean history know the huge disconnect between official history and then those who experienced it. So I was just wondering on like, what are your current notes of, you know, like critical notes of self-regulation in providing that kind of counter narrative to even events like that 2017 footage that you showed, or if you have any like suspicions or notes on um, the narrative of North Korea that we're given versus what is. And hi everybody, hi Kyung, hi Viet, hi Erica, hi Valerie, hi Todd, and other squares I can't see on my screen. <laughs> I mean, I think well, that counter narrative is so important, you know, um, and, you know, I mean, how often do we like scream back at the, the screen when they're giving us some, what they call facts and I think, oh my God, that's not true or whatever. Um, but I didn't understand what you were saying. What were you referring to about to, to, to 2017 that you're talking about? Well, the news footage that you showed, like how much, you oh, know, exactly. isn't there a level of suspicion that you have of what you're being shown? You know, that kind of like self-critical, self-regulated critical eye yes. that you have. Well, about that guy who uh, escaped, uh, you know, from the North to the South, I, I, that made the big news actually in, in South Korea. And uh, um, so I, I took it, and, and then there's, also some other news of that that guy who is who actually might have killed somebody in north before he fled and so there's just so much more information but i just wanted to use that bit just to talk about uh choco, choco pies because he the first thing when he woke up uh, after the operations was he wanted choco pies and i thought that was enough to make him fit into my narrative, you know, in a sense. So, yeah, but uh, it's not, yeah, I mean, but I, that's one of my ways that I kind of um, interweave, interweave um, some of these, you know, curious little stories, you know, occasionally, yeah. I think, Jin Mi, you have to un unmute yourself. Yeah, hi, Young Sun. it's so nice to see you. Um, uh, thank you so much for that talk. I just wanna say, um, first of all, uh, your 40 years plus of um, making work uh, at, and, and a kind of histori historiography, which is a very associative. It's also um, a very scholarly in many ways, but has a kind of form that I think is quite unique to uh, presenting it um, as an artist. Uh, and I think in, in, when I think of uh, Alexian, you're kind of um, inheriting many of the uh, ways in which I think diasporic subjects can uh, crisscross and tell stories in very different kinds of ways. And my question is um, about your, the reception of your work in uh, the different receptions of your work, not that it's monolithic in any case, but in, 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 um, in Korea and South Korea and also elsewhere. I mean, certainly when I invited you to be an artist in residence at, at my university uh, in, in Vancouver, um, Canada, uh, that was a very different kind of uh, relationship, I think, um, that you found with the kind of uh, uh, ways in which people understood the relationship to the Cold War, for example, right, in the Canadian context. So can you speak a little bit more about um, the reception of your work and, and the way that you uh, work with history uh, to complicate it, to, um, to give uh, a, a kind of 
uh, affective and also like a associative kind of charge that seems insignificant, but like the choco pie being a, a metonym for so much, right? In terms of what you were talking about, in terms of uh, the relationship between uh, capitalism and, and consumption and desire and uh, et cetera, et cetera, propaganda. So I'd like you to um, expand on that a little bit because I've been so curious that you showed so much and uh, I, I've always wondered, you know, um, and it's been very prescient in your work, like for example, in terms of um, migrant labors in Korea, uh, you were doing that work before it was even uh, kind of really talked about uh, much and uh, Korea was still kind of pretending it was a homogenous nation and uh, such. And also in terms of Vietnam, um, our, the, the Korean um, involvement in the Vietnam War and also how you inter intersected that also with relationships to sexuality and emasculation and, and how that got played out in terms of Korean men and when they got to Vietnam and what they had to do you know, to, to, to uh, remasculate themselves. Uh, in relation to uh, the US, uh, for example. So, I mean, all these things I've seen in your work, but really what I, I wanna say is, I think that's, that's the charge of the work, but also um, I wanna just focus on maybe you speaking about the reception, because I think that's really interesting to me, how you crisscross different well, audiences and different, you know. I really appreciate your comments and uh you're so eloquent when you speak. I always love listening to you. <laughs> no, but anyway, you uh, get share a lot of similarities because you're an immigrant to, uh, to uh, Canada. But I, um, yeah, and, and the reception uh, question is uh, interesting because I think in Korea, they, I mean, in the States, it's off and on, whatever, but uh, but in Korea, I feel that um, there's a little bit of recognition, you know, they purchased a couple of my pieces, whatever, but I, I don't know. Um, and I think the, um, you know, in the early stages, uh, like in the, uh, but, the 90s and whatever, you know, a lot of people complained there about the use of, the, there's so much English in my text, you know, in my work. And so they thought it's really hard for Koreans to make sense of that work actually. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but uh, now, you know, I don't know. Um, I, I really haven't pushed it that much. And, but uh, yeah, I guess it's still a question like, you know, what, is the reception there? You know, I really, I don't know that I'm the person to ask about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, my notion is that uh, I know some people there and um, but that's about it. I don't, I, yeah. I mean, I, I think I have this, some of the kind of issues that you might have in relation to Korea, you know, because mm -hmm. you know, probably the same people and even more that, that, than I, I know. And, uh, but, uh, you know, but I, I think that, you know, I used to go to the, a lot of, the, when I, the, when we had a chance to travel to different places, you know, I would go to the, see the documenta or other shows. And I think, you know, that for international shows, there's very little regard for those of us in the diaspora for the most part, like Asian Americans or Canadian, you know, uh, Americans or whatever, um, because I think that a lot of the curators are looking for what they perceive to be a certain kind of authenticity, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you know, and and they don't look to us for that because they, they feel like we should go to Korea. They're the real things, you know, the real politics, and mm -hmm. they look at our work and they think, huh, you know, I mean, it, they think it's a little watered down or a little bit, uh, it's like too much, uh, too far from the actual details that they want or something. I, I'm really not sure. So mm -hmm. it's just a constant um, issue. There. Yeah, I, I would love to have uh, another conversation with you. Maybe we can get together and do that over Zoom or something. But thank you so much, Yonsun.
Thanks so much for your words. Okay, so um, uh, thank you very much to Yang Sun uh, for uh, lecturing at the Transnational Korean Studies at UCSD.